A couple of weeks ago, we started this study of restoration principles because it's a matter of fact that the church has not continued on, at least in recorded history. And I say that to give emphasis in recorded history so that anybody can trace themselves all the way back to the very church that was established on the day of Pentecost. Well, then what are we to do? Well, I mentioned this morning and last week that there is the seed principle. That if you take the seed, which is the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, verse 11, and you teach it to people with honest, good hearts, verse 15 of Luke 8, then when they believe it, obey it, and submit to its, author submit to its authority, there will be reproduced the same church that the Word of God preached in the first century, produced when men believed it and obeyed it. But we noticed in this study that while that was done and the church established and the gospel spread in the first century, that even beginning in the first century, men began to depart from the divine plan. And in time, there were many, many departures and unauthorized practices adopted by those calling themselves Christians. I might say that one of the things many of them continue to hold on to, though when it comes to how a person is saved, when a person is saved, the organization and the work and worship of the church, uh, many errors crept in in the first 300 years after the church was established, they continue to live much according to the moral teaching. And in that, they impacted the Roman Empire in a great way. But as men departed over a period of time, and from about 1,000 to 1,500, there were multitudinous doctrinal changes and additions, then Roman Catholicism reigned supreme. And let me mention again, that Roman Catholicism is not an apostate church. To be apostate meant you once had to be the real thing. Well, the Roman Catholic Church there was a real thing. It formed out of people who fell away from the truth. And that falling away started in the first century even and continued then for some years. That Roman Catholicism formed itself out of those who fell away from the truth. But in time... Men sought to return to the divine plan. Why did they do this? Well, they realized that there were all sorts of departures from the true plan. They understood that there had been over many years innovations and there had been thereby corruptions. And from about 800 A.D. onward, there were numerous reformatory efforts made. Now, we don't read about many of those earlier than the 1400s, especially the 1500s into the 1600s. But there were those that tried, but you must remember, by that time, Roman Catholicism had a terrible grip on all of Europe. And Roman Catholicism believes in running civil government and running the home. And if you did not submit to all that Roman Catholicism taught, which carried you back to the Pope at Rome, then you would not be treated very nice at all, and you would be excommunicated, and thus all of Europe would be opposed to you. It was a time of great ignorance and a great many things, but especially the Bible. The average European in those days couldn't read or write, they didn't live much ahead of where the animals lived. They were truly peasants, and they were under not only control of a feudal system, but the feudal system was under the control of Roman Catholicism. You can learn a lot if you ever get a chance to do so in looking at those old cathedrals that were built back around 1,000 and some of them before, and realize that they are monstrosities today as far as the size of them. But in the days in which they were built, they were even greater uh, domineering facilities than they were now. And since the people couldn't read, of course, they carved gargoyles into them and trying to scare the people into obedience to the Pope at Rome and all of the Roman Catholics. And 
they, you must remember that the priests are the way, or through the priesthood, Roman Catholic priesthood, is the way that salvation is extended by what's called the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, which they still uphold, to mankind. And if you cross those priests, then you were excommunicate and you were in big trouble because you were out of harmony with everything there was around. There's just no way you can begin to appreciate what went on. And thus, that thousand-year period is called the Dark Ages by history. But if you read Roman Catholic writers, they'll call it the Glorious Age of the Church. Well, why not? They ran everything. They controlled it all. Everybody had to submit to them. But if you go back to as early as 839 in Italy, there was the work of a fellow by the name of Claudius of Turin. There was a fellow also at about that same, well, it was several hundred years later, but as far as we're concerned, it fit about the same time. Peter of Bruges, uh, he died in 1126. And they were working to try to get the church reformed. Well, they saw all of these terrible corruptions, but it seemingly never dawned on them to get back to the Bible. Because the Bible belonged to the clergy. It was all written in Latin. The ordinary person couldn't read it if he wanted to. Most of them were chained to the altars in the great cathedrals, and thus they were read only by the priest in the liturgical uh, carrying on that they did in uh, mass and so forth. In France, there was the work of the Albigenses in uh, around 1170, and the work of the Waldensians about the same time. A fellow by the name of William of Ockham worked in England for Reformation. He lived between 1280 and 1349. There were the then it starts catching on more. There were the great labors of, of John Wycliffe in England from 1324 to 1384. John Huss worked in Bohemia in 1369. That's over in the Czech area, Slovakian area of today, 1369 through 1415. And in Germany... And remember, there was no unified German deal around the 1870s, so these are the German states, very small, petty kingdoms. There was the work of John Ruslin from 1455 to 1522. And he happened to be, and none of this will make any sense to you unless you've studied some of this, the uncle of Melchthon, who was very instrumental in all of this kind of thing. Most of these fellows were trying to work within the scriptures, that is, to get them translated and to try to deal in that way. A fellow by the name of uh, Jerome Savonarola worked in Italy in 1452 to 1498. And in Holland, there was the great work of Erasmus, 1465 to 1536. He put together a Greek text, and from it a great many things were developed. And what I mentioned here in just a moment, I wouldn't expect everybody here to know, but if you study the beginnings of the early Reformation in Europe, then you'll find that these people played a great part in preparing the groundwork for what others would do because they laid the groundwork for what is called the Protestant Reformation, and some of the later ones were a part of that Protestant Reformation. Now, you hear about Protestant churches today, and most of them, the average member at least, doesn't even know why they're called Protestant churches. Protestant means protest. And these people, like Luther and others at that time, were protesting the corruption in Roman Catholicism. They were members in good standing in Roman Catholicism. But they saw all of this corruption. And seemingly, though, it never dawned on them to forget about the corrupted church that had no authority to exist anyway as far as scriptures are concerned, and just go back to the New Testament itself. It began to dawn on them, but trying to see through all of that, they were not able to do. So these are groups that were protesting the corruption of Roman Catholicism, and the Roman Church opposed them vigorously and caused the deaths of many people who involved themselves with it. 
there was complete disregard in the Roman church for preaching and teaching the Bible. Now, there's a reason for that, and that's the reason we had the debate here many years ago with the Catholics on that very point. It's because they do not believe the Bible, the Bible only, is the only rule of faith and practice. They believe the Bible plus the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, the teaching arm of the Roman Catholic Church, constitutes the authority. Well, that means anywhere that they have a conclave or a council or whatever that's officially called, and they decide in that council to change what the Bible plainly says on something, then when they do it, that's the same as the Holy Spirit writing through Paul or through Peter or anybody else, and thus that's what they claim for their bishops, that they are all in the place of apostles of Christ. And that's the reason the Pope, who in the Roman Catholicism, that's the reason that his word, when he speaks officially, becomes the authoritative, inspired word of God. And many of them, though you don't hear it much nowadays, but among the rank and file devoted Roman Catholics, he is Lord God the Pope, the vicar of Christ on earth. And when he speaks ex cathedra, that is officially from the sea, as they call it, of St. Peter, on the throne of St. Peter, that's just like scripture you read. So they believe that is inspired as your New Testament is. Well, they think that has to be because you've got to keep the church up to date. And after all, the New Testament's at least 2,000 years old, and so they think that's the Word of God, but they think it was limited to the first century. And therefore, you've got to keep the church up to date so you have all of these other things going on. But let me mark one thing for you. You will never see a change in Roman Catholicism that alters the seven sacraments. In all of the so-called liberalization that's gone on in the Roman Catholic Church over the years, they've never given up or altered the seven sacraments. They're still there. They're still the same. And it still puts the Roman Catholic Church in the position it's always had. Well, back in a time when people couldn't read, they were scared to death and spooked to death by all these things that go bump in the night and gargoyles and all of the stuff that gets celebrated now at Halloween was once looked upon <laughs> as something serious, real, and the booger bears are going to get you if you don't watch out. My grandmother used to sing a little song to us. We were little, and it went, woo, woo, woo. The wind is saying, while the goblins are at play, you'd better be good, or the witches from the wood will woo, woo, carry you away someday. And it goes on with that. Well, you think, and we laugh about that, and it scares scare us kids to death, and she'd laugh. And, but we all knew that didn't. But there was a time people believed that. And all this stuff you see was carried on right over there under the auspices of Roman Catholicism. And it suited them fine because it kept the people in line. And that's what they were interested in. So they were a superstitious lot, all kinds of superstitious rites and ceremonies that are unknown to the Word of God. When Roman Catholicism would go into any certain area, whether it was Europe or whether it was Mexico or South America, anywhere like that, then what they would do to convert people were to take the old pagan superstitions, pagan holidays, and so forth, and turn them into something pertaining to Christianity. And thus, you move from one country to another, and you'll see they have different ideas and thoughts. It's because they simply turn those pagan views into something connected with Christianity, and that way they got their loyalty. There was corruption in the lives of the priests, I've already mentioned. There was the common practice of simony. Uh, theoretically, remission of sins could be purchased. Uh, indulgences were commonly sold. They haven't given up all of that. You just don't hear much about it, but from time to time, they do it as it suits them, as it profits them. They have always been a system of meritorious works. 
Meritorious works means the more you do that's good, as they define good, then the greater expectation of heaven you'll receive. That's the reason that when these Protestant churches protesting salvation by a meritorious system opposed it, that they went to the other extreme and said, you're saved by faith only. There's not any kind of works you're required to do in order to be saved from your sins. Completely rejecting, and that's the reason Luther almost would not accept the book of James to be in the scriptures. He called it a right, strawy book because it requires men to be obedient, to have an obedient faith. So they never made that distinction. You would think they would. They were very knowledgeable people, very studious people. But it goes to show you that once some sort of doctrine or custom or tradition gets hold of people over many generations, it gets very difficult to root it completely out of people. And many times when they do give it up, they will run to the other extreme. A fellow by the name of Pope Leo X needed large sums of money in order to build St. Peter's Church at Rome, the very one that sits over there today. He authorized a fellow by the name of John Tetzel to sell certificates that the Pope had signed. And uh, these certificates purported to forgive all the sins of all the persons in whose behalf they were purchased, whether they were living or whether they were dead. Tetzel said, as soon as your coin clinks in the chest, I'm quoting, that is the chest that holds the money, clinks in the chest, the souls of your friends will rise out of purgatory to heaven, unquote. So you see the kind of superstitious mind people had to have and had had it for hundreds of years to ever believe any such thing as that. But this effort by Pope Leo X through John Tetzel, and he traveled throughout Europe raising this money in this way, was really, the we might say, the straw that broke the camel's back. This is when Martin Luther rose up and denounced in no uncertain terms the works of Tetzel and the practice of selling indulgences itself. And thus Luther wrote out what has become known in his 95 statements or theses in opposition to indulgence indulgences, this one in particular, that was authorized by the Pope and the special priesthood. And on October the 31st, 1517, and I might say it took remarkable courage on his part, Luther nailed these objections to the door of the Wittenberg German chapel. And Luther was excommunicated in June of 1520. And he took the papal bull, that's what they call that excommunication doctrine, and he burned the thing on December 10th, 1520. So this act meant that Luther had completely renounced Roman Catholicism. Now, in addition to Luther... There were other great reformers rising up this time. These, we've got to remember, they had no protection from anybody. Uh, these folks were putting themselves, their necks literally on the chopping block, or in that day and time, uh, tying themselves, you might say, to the stake that would burn them. Philip Melanchthon in 1497-1560 was Luther's beloved friend and fellow worker. And what's interesting about these people, when you study about them, they were well-educated, highly educated. And this man I just mentioned is a scholar, and he was the author of what is known as the Augsburg Confession of Faith. The fellow that I like the best out of all these fellows, all of them were working finally to get the Bible into the native language of the people. But a fellow by the name of Ulrich Zwingli, 1484 to 1531, a Swiss from Switzerland, had a profound respect for the authority of the scriptures. And he's the only one out of this crowd that 
insisted that you do only what's authorized by the scriptures for worship and you leave undone what's not authorized and forbidden. I don't know how far he could have gone, but he debated Luther. Luther believed that you can do anything that's not expressly forbidden. And that's what they had the debate about. And then not long thereafter, Zwingli was killed. So I don't know what he would have been able to do if he had stayed alive, but he's the only one of them that I know anything about that held the view that we all need concerning the Word of God being the final authority. That we must do as it authorizes, not just do what is not expressly forbidden. You know, it's not expressly forbidden in just so many words, thou shalt not kiss the Pope's toe. If I've got to find that in the Bible before I know I don't kiss the Pope's toe in an act, toe in an act of homage, I, I, that'd be all right to do so. And there's a whole host of folks that believe in that. If you go in the door of the Vatican over there today, St. Peter's Cathedral, you'll see a big statue of Peter sitting there, and it's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you look at his big toe, you'll see it's completely smoothed off because so many people have kissed it going in. So you've got that kind of thing, and we have grown up in America to where that kind of thing seems so foreign. But it's not in so many places. People are in darkness, and they need the gospel. Well, leaving um, Zwingli a minute and Luther, we come across a fellow by the name of John Calvin, 1509 to 1564. He again was a great Swiss reformer. He was meaner than a snake because if you were to cross him, he'd kill you just like the Catholics. He didn't mind doing it. And he believed, though, in the absolute authority of the Scriptures. And he, through his revival of what we know as Calvinism, influenced the fellow greatly from in Scotland, who was a guy by the name of John Knox, 1505 to 1572. Now, these folks all lived in the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, um, and uh, Elizabeth I of England. So he was the great reformer in Scotland, and to this day, the state church of Scotland is the Presbyterian church. I always find that interesting because the monarch of England is the head of the Anglican church, the Church of England. But you've got to remember that's the United Kingdom, and she's the queen also of Scotland. But guess what? It's the Presbyterian church up there, <laughs> That is the state church. And I don't know what they're going to do when it comes to all the Muslims that are rising up over there because I can't hardly see the monarch of England being the head of a Muslim mess. So through his work and influence, John Knox that is, the Presbyterian church became the established church in Scotland. By the way, let me throw this in. I think most of you have heard of what's called by those people over there the Troubles in Northern Ireland. If you remember, that was really hot back in the 70s. Well, there is a Northern Ireland still loyal and still a part of the United Kingdom. The rest of Ireland's independent, and they got their independence in the 1920s. They fought for it for I don't know how many years. They finally got it in the 1920s. But I think it's either five or six counties, I don't remember which, that remain loyal to uh, the crown or their part of the United Kingdom. And you say, well, how could they in Ireland do that? Because it shows you how things that happen in history affect things right on down to our day. The Scottish clans were like a bunch of wild Indians. And they would raid over into northern England. And they were trouble for hundreds of years. So in the days roughly of Queen Elizabeth, back along that, about that time, they had a solution. They would simply move those clans off the border that were just north of England, there in Scotland, over to Northern Ireland. Thus, they moved them over there, and they populated those counties and became the predominant people. Thus, they're Protestant Northern Ireland. That's the reason that you had big fight going on over there and it was big trouble back in the 70s and even into the early 80s, uh, even through the 80s. But that all anchored in things uh, back, what, 500 years ago, and it still bothered people today. Well, they're Protestant up there in Southern Ireland's Catholic. 
which is called the Free State by them. Now, church histories, if you look at a bunch of them, lists five basic principles of the Reformation, Reformation, Protestant Reformation in Europe. First of all, the Bible, the Word of God, the source of authority, and the only rule of faith and practice. That was the greatest thing in my feeble judgment that came out of all of that effort to reform. It freed the Bible and got it into the languages of the ordinary people. And just that study itself is a very enlightening one for what people went through just to get our Bible into the English language. The next point is that religious principles and practices should be in harmony with man's rational nature. And you see how that began to fit in with what was called the Renaissance. It was taking place in Europe at the same time, the Protestant Reformation. I think one really fed off of the other. But people were being taught to think. Some of your great philosophers rose up at that time. Not that a whole lot of them were that friendly to the Protestant Reformation. But nevertheless, they were teaching about thinking. And I might throw this one out. One of the great philosophers whose principles influenced uh, members of the church early on was John Locke. And he influenced America because of his view on common law and so forth. The third point is that the universal priesthood of all believers was emphasized in the Protestant Reformation. That is, that religion is personal. You can study your Bible and learn what God requires of you, and you can personally obey it. Well, you see, Roman Catholicism had you all hooked up with them. If you don't do what we tell you, then you can't be what you ought to be. And we will make you do what we think you ought to do. And you're not free to read the Scriptures. Most of them couldn't have read it anyway because it was written in Latin. And uh, the priest will tell you what you need to know because that's what he's there for. Then number four is that religion should be simple, should be inward. It should be, therefore, spiritual. It should not be complicated, external, and physical. Now, if you study about Roman Catholicism or you talk to a devout Catholic who's been raised in Roman Catholicism, you'll see pretty quick just how much everything is ritual and ritual and ritual. I've talked to two or three that were not practicing Catholics later on, whatever a practicing Catholic is, and they would declare all they could remember was having to get up and down and recite this and recite that and up and down and recite. And if you've ever been, some of us may have been, to a Roman Catholic funeral, and uh, when they will say the rosary, have you ever wondered why it just goes on and on and on and on? Hail Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And, it, and they just repeat it over and over. It is a, a effort to the more you say and the more you do, the more merit you accrue and the more it works for you in your salvation. Well, that's exactly why. Then the fifth point is that these Protestant reformers sought to establish, and this is where they made a mistake, national churches, but churches that were independent of Rome and with service conducted in the language of the people. So it wasn't a total loss. But nevertheless, they didn't have those things clear that they needed to concerning the real and true gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me emphasize again that it should be noted that all the reformers had been reared as members, devout members of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, many of them had served as priests. But they became sick of departures and innovations and unauthorized practices. They wanted to do this, and as I said earlier, this was the great thing. They earnestly desired to do that end that they work and give their lives to restore the Bible to its rightful place of authority. The basic thought, and it should not have been this, but it was, the basic thought underlying the lives and works of the men I'm referring to was reformation, reformation. They seemingly, say for Zwingli, and he didn't live long enough to carry it out, they seemingly never got the idea of a plan to restore. They simply thought of reforming Roman Catholicism. And that was a mistake. If you take 
an institution that was never authorized in the first place. And it's gone awry even further than what it was meant to when it started, though it's unauthorized. And you reform it, all you have then is reform unauthorized institution. And they seemingly never saw beyond that. The lives and works of these men then resulted in what was known and is known is Protestant denominationalism. That's the way most people know of Christianity today. They cannot conceive of the Lord's church as it appears on the New Testament where there was no denominationalism, Protestant or otherwise, certainly no Roman Catholic church. And every warning that could be said that the church would fall away from the truth they missed it. I don't know how, but it is frightening to me because if they did, guess what? I can. So no wonder the Bible emphasizes the importance of honesty of heart, diligence, and working hard to study the truth and make sure we understand it. The reformers and those that followed them, such as Lutherans, Presbyterians and Baptists and others began practicing in principle the very things they actually were opposed to when they started out. They adopted human creeds. They engaged in numerous unscriptural activities and unauthorized practices. If they had been able to keep the spark that was in those men like Luther and others when they started, they may have gone on beyond it. But there's something peculiar about the way people operate. It's true in establishing nations and every other way. You have the people who are the crusaders who started out, who originally started, and they have a good idea. But then it begins to pull together in its own little body and once those who started the thing are out of the picture, the second and third generation begin to try to just preserve as far as they got, and they lose that desire to continue to press on till they get to the genuine article. And that's what's happened, and it's a danger to everybody. But then came what we know as the Great Restoration Movement. We have stressed thus far that the reformers sought to do just that, reform, to remove corruptions that were characteristic of the Roman system. Remember, it was never their aim to restore. It was not their purpose, and they did not work to that end, to make a complete return to simple, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. And therefore, as had been the case in Roman Catholicism, so it came to be the case to the various denominational bodies which grew out of the Reformation. Numerous religious errors came to be characteristic of these Protestant denominations. There were errors related to, number one, organization and government as far as the Lord's Church is concerned. There were errors in worship. There were errors in how do you refer to this body. Names, therefore. There were errors in creeds and confessions. Understanding the true New Testament teaching on baptism. Who was subject to baptism. There are just a multiplicity of matters of doctrine that they went around and continue to this day be around. Now, there was a time when they had their particular manuals, prayer books, catechisms, and they were very particular about each denomination adhering to them, and they would not cooperate with one another. In other words, if you were not a Presbyterian, you couldn't go and partake, partake of what they call the Lord's Supper. You had to be a Presbyterian to do so. So they were very much in opposition to one another. Now, that's not hardly known now because those same denominations pretty much say, well, we're all all right. I just like going over here and you just like going over there. 
And so we just keep going, but I'm okay and you're okay. And thus, in the last 40 years, there's given rise to the community church where just a hodgepodge of believing whatever any denomination believes, and you're welcome here. And again, that's because people have failed to understand the authority of the Bible and the need to study it to learn the truth. And so they continue down a very loose path. Now, there were numerous great and I think very good men in Europe and in America who were deeply concerned about the religious situation that existed in around 1700. I wish we had time to just read about some of the people and what they were doing in Scotland at that time. There were many laws against them preaching. I remember one time, in fact, if you go there today, you almost can still go stand right where they stood. <laughs> and some of that stuff is still standing right where it was when they did it. But they passed a law that you could not preach in the roadways. Well, if you've ever seen Scotland and Ireland and all of that over there in northern England, they've got every kind of stone wall that ever existed. So what did they do? They stood on the stone wall and preached, but preach they did. So there was all kinds of things to restrict people, and there wasn't the freedom we've known and that we have enjoyed all these years in America. Now, these good men I mentioned knew that the then current situation was out of harmony with the New Testament teaching because by 1700, they had a long time to read their Bibles, and they did. And they had a wonderful knowledge of the problem, and they were prayerfully concerned about the right kind of solution to those problems. They believed confidently, and they affirmed that the only real solution was a complete restoration of simple New Testament Christianity. In other words, a complete return to the original gospel as they all could read in the Bible. Well, I think it's interesting in view of the restrictions through laws and religious situation in Europe that none of that really made its growth and development until America. Now, there's been a great effort to point out that there were churches of Christ in that part of the world back in the 1600s and so forth. And I remember one time talking to the late Ken Chumley. In fact, I've got a picture, or did have, I know he did, of where he was visiting a Baptist church building that had been there since the 1600s and earlier. Because you know what we call old over here doesn't begin to fit old over there. <laughs> and he was standing out front with the Baptist preacher and they were holding a communion service. And the preacher said, you know, this really belongs to you and not us. Because what happened is that long about this time period, the few churches of Christ that existed turned into the Baptist church. And they know that over there. And I visited some of those buildings where the church did meet. Now, everything that was not a part of Protestant denominationalism doesn't mean it was all in harmony with the New Testament or New Testament Christianity, but the seed was there, and it was growing. And when it came to America, it really began to grow. Now, in Europe, there were the labors of great men, and they were usually associated with what's called the independence in Scotland, independent of Presbyterianism. And a listing of these men would include the names of James and Robert Haldane, John Glass, Robert Sandyman, Roland Hill, Greville Ewing, John Walker, Alexander Carson. Now, I dare say you've not heard of any of those. Some of you may have heard of some of them. But they were the ones that laid the groundwork for what uh, uh, Alexander Campbell and his daddy did, especially his father, Thomas Campbell. They had all of this return to the Bible and speak where the Bible and speaks and be silent where it's silent coming from these men. I've often thought what a wonderful thing it would have been if gone over there and done a doctorate just on the study of these men and their roots related to what took place over here. <laughs> 
It still can be done for anybody that wants to don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> but I'm far past any idea of doing it. Likewise, in America, there were then effective labors of great and good men. And these were overlapping one another. You had some like James O'Kelly and Rice Haggard and Elias Smith and Abner Jones, Barton W. Stone, Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell I mentioned. But then there was also Walter Scott. Later in America, there were other great workers who might be called in the second generation restoration leaders. And they were W.K. Pendleton and D.S. Burnett and Benjamin Franklin, not the political man, but the preacher. Samuel Rogers, Talbert Fanning, Jacob Kreth, and John Smith. And he didn't like to be called this, but Raccoon John Smith. Moses Lard and J.W. McGarvey, who was on toward and into the 20th century. What did all these men have in common? Not to establish a new religious body that had never been on this earth. They were pleading and begging and working to return to what was already there in the seed form in the first place, primitive, pure New Testament Christianity, a restoration of things as were there. So these men were pleading with others, with all men everywhere, to resolve to speak where the Bible speaks, to be silent where the Bible is silent, to have no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but the divine name, to determine to do nothing in matters of religion except that divinely authorized. And they stood true to that for most of the 19th century. But even then, and we might get to that later, even then, many begin to fall away. And let me close this in, installment of this study of the Restoration by simply saying there's never going to be a time when the fundamentals and first principles don't need to be taught. And that the seed principle needs to be taught. That wherever you are, if you take your Bible, especially the New Testament, then the church can be there if people will believe it and obey it. That's all it takes. It may sound easily said, and it is, but it takes effort and dedication on your part to do that. But there's no reason for the church to ever cease to be, as long as we have the Bible. And guess who's promised something about that Bible? Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word will not pass away. The seed of the kingdom will always be here. What we do with it's another story, but it'll always be here. But we can always have the church that Jesus built if we will but follow the divine infallible blueprint that is the pattern of New Testament Christianity. Thus, when we invite people to obey the gospel today, we're talking about the gospel that was first preached in the first century and is recorded in your New Testament. The power of God to save you from sin. When we preach that one must believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God, Repent of one's sins, confess one's faith in Christ, and be baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. We're preaching what was originally found and is found to this day in the New Testament. And more than that, it'll be opened on the day of judgment. And as to who's a Christian and who's not, will be judged according to that great plan. And the rest of what the Bible teaches about the church in her work, organization, and worship, and individual Christian living in it is all laid out there. It's just a matter of whether we want it or not and how much are we willing to sacrifice to be able to hold on tenaciously to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you need to obey the gospel this afternoon, now's the time to do it. As a child of God, if you've wandered afar, we invite you to consider your life, repent of your sins, Come back repenting of them and confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the great call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.